Oh, what a blessing this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Before I get into that this morning, into God's Word, I forgot to mention all of you have a packet of information with you this morning. That is for our candidate for the full-time worship and youth leader position. Um, out of respect for him and his current church and current employer, I just ask that we wouldn't use his name kind of out in social media in that realm quite yet. But he will be here leading worship on May 7th. So I want to encourage all of you to review that packet, take a look at the information that's in there, and come be a part of worship on May 7th. Following that service, we will have a, a vote on him. We'll call a business meeting uh, and have a vote on his candidacy. So it's an exciting time to be a part of First Baptist Church. Um, we've already, prior to this, been talking about how wonderful it is to see God at work, just kind of plugging in pieces as needed, bringing us new people um, to serve in different capacities with different experiences and everything else. This is yet another part of watching God work in the life of our church and our community. So um, we're blessed and come be a part of that. All right, so here's the question I'm going to start out with this morning as we get ready to dive into God's Word. Have you ever settled for anything in your life? All right, I wanted to look around to start with and just see if there were any sideways glances at spouses or anything like that. If there was, hopefully they didn't see you. Hopefully, hopefully it wasn't your spouse that you think of when you talk about settling for something. Maybe when you were a kid, guys, you know, you were, you were a 16-year-old boy with your driver's license and you wanted, I don't know, depending on how old you are, you either wanted a Ferrari, you wanted a muscle car, you wanted something like that, but you probably settled for dad's old Ford Pinto or something similar to it. Maybe you thought you were going to be successful, you wanted to live in that big mansion, but maybe you settled for a two-bedroom apartment to get started. You wanted to run your own company, maybe you just eventually settled to, into any other job you can think of. Maybe you wanted to lose 30 pounds, but you just wound up settling for skipping dessert a couple times. You wanted steak, you settled for a turkey burger. You wanted french fries, you settled for kale chips. You get my point. There is a difference between living life, sorry, let me rephrase that. There is a difference between living and life, right? Difference between living and life. For many people, living is little more than just letting time pass day by day, going through the motions just, just to make ends meet and move on to the next day. You know, wake up, take a shower, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed, lather, rinse, repeat over and over again. Maybe you're just subsisting or scraping by, wondering what the point of everything is. In today's chaos in the world around us, it may even be the case that you're wondering what the point of it all is. Even if you have a whole bunch of money sitting in your bank account, it looks like things are going good. But you just wonder, what is the point of it? We see the suicide rate in Western nations skyrocketing in the midst of having wealth. Uh, you see nihilism all around us, people wondering. There's no point to this. What's the point of going on? There's nothing afterwards. There's nothing more to life. They're just drifting along. You guys sang Lighthouse this morning. They're drifting along without a shore in sight, drifting along without an anchor to hold fast to. They're living, but they're lost. Maybe you're still fulfilling your earthly obligations to work and to family, all those things, but it's just a drudgery of daily life. The difference in a lot of ways, I think, between living and life is settling. People settle a lot of times for what they can control, what they're used to, what they're familiar with, what's easy. 
And we've talked in recent weeks in, in sermons about the early church, the earliest believers, and kind of what their lives looked like. And something through those conversations has stuck with me. There were people that we looked at who would get together constantly. They would get together daily. Imagine if we all got together daily and still liked each other. That'd be cool. They got together daily for the purposes of teaching and fellowship, sharing meals, prayer. We talked about those things. They looked radically different from anything else in the world around them and even radically different than what we see in the world around us. That was their life. Why? Because all of their lives, every aspect of their life revolved and involved Jesus. That was the center point. That was the anchor. Him. And I've had that idea stuck in my head, that idea of everything revolving around Jesus and that picture of the early Christians breaking bread together constantly. And I'm not ready to leave that yet. So we're not moving on in our, our Acts series this morning. I, I want to come back and, and keep hanging out somewhere. I want to talk about something related to it, but again, that I just haven't been able to get away from, and that's bread. Yeah, I want to talk about bread. Wow, pastor, that sounds like a riveting sermon. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I'm, I'm not here to swap recipes with you. It did make me think, though. My, uh, my grandmother, um, who's long since passed from this world, and I know exactly where she is today, she used to make the most amazing biscuits. Light, fluffy, just perfect. You know, you got that kind of crust on the outside, soft on the inside. It's perfect. Well, when she passed, she was my mom's mom. She decided, I'll take her recipe and I'll learn to make biscuits now. It had always been her job. But we used to joke in my family as my mom was trying to learn how to make biscuits by the same recipe as my grandmother and make them turn out like hers. You could kill somebody with those biscuits. <laughs> they were rock hard. Mom, I love you. She did finally get it right, by the way, but it took a while, and it was a running gag in our family for a long time that we could throw them and put a hole in the wall. <laughs> My point in telling you all that is that not all bread is created equal. You guys know that if you've had any family meals on Sundays. Not all bread is created equal. But bread illustrations are all over the place in the Bible. They're, they're all over the place because it was a staple food of the time. And so it's a really simple picture that everybody then could wrap their heads around and their hearts around and understand what was being said and what was going on. And it keeps coming up, too, with Jesus and his earliest believers. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. We're, we're going to get to that, too. And that fact and the delicious, delicious carbs make me love bread. The message that I want to share with you this morning is this. God doesn't want you to settle for crumbs. He wants you to live life to the fullest. Let's start out here. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Matthew's version is the most complete version of this particular account in the Gospels. And this is uh, the story of Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. It says this. This is the first of the three temptings in Matthew's account. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Got to be sounding really good to Jesus right about then. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now notice here, as we start digging into some different passages related to bread, Jesus doesn't answer the, if you are the son of God, part of Satan's uh, tempting here. His response, essentially, by going to Scripture, is to say, no matter who I am, I follow God's word. 
the Scriptures. Satan, for his part, often seeks to tempt us when the immediacy of our physical needs and wants is greatest because he knows how weak we are. To what in those cases will we turn? Well, we know what Satan hopes that we'll turn to. In whom do we trust at those times when deliverance seems unlikely? But there's bigger stuff at play here. This is a quote that Jesus uses from Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 5. But before we get to running through that, I want to pull something else out. It says, man shall not live by bread alone. Shall not. Well, that's odd because bread back then kept a whole lot of people alive. But God designed us for something more. We shall then, by implication, live by every word from the mouth of God. That's what we're designed for. That's where true life comes from, and that's what we'll keep seeing over and over again. Somebody can be living on bread and not actually be alive. That's what that says. They could be living on bread and not be alive. To truly be alive, we have to be spiritually fed. That's the root and the source of life. The passage from Deuteronomy that Jesus is quoting from, and Deuteronomy is his favorite book to quote from, it says this, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Would you hold fast to the Lord even when you weren't sure what the outcome would be? And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. In other words, you hadn't seen it before. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man, here we go, does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he goes on, your clothing did not wear out on you. Your foot did not swell these 40 years. God provided supernaturally for you in the midst of all of this. Food, clothing, all of this. Know then in your heart that as a man dis disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. He is working through those difficult times to bring you to where you need to be, to where he wants you to be, and to the best possible place for you to be, closer to him. The passage says, living by God's word is true life. That's life. And through it, you'll find the promises of God fulfilled. The very act of choosing to follow or not God's commandments is a test. That was the test, the tempting that Jesus was being put to by Satan. But it was the test that Jesus was passing from God. And the answers that we give when we're tested or tempted in that way, like it or not, they reflect the desires of our hearts. Are our hearts for him or against him? The Israelites, for their part, they got to see that their physical provisions in a very real, very immediate, very unmistakable way came from God. The truth for us and for them, is that even if it isn't manna, again, obviously coming from God, provided by God, even if it's not manna that's so obvious, even if it's bread from the supermarket, it still came from God. What a blessing to know it, to remember it, to realize it. It's God who provides and sustains when he is our source and no one and nothing else. Deuteronomy 8, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but it actually goes on to warn the Israelites that they're going to be tempted to forget God, not when his presence is removed, 
But when their bellies are full, they're going to find themselves in material abundance. And that's a threat. Because how easy is it for them, for us, to start relying on things and on people besides God or God's word to start thinking that they're the source, that we're the source of what we have and what we need. We begin to think that man really does live on bread alone, and that we provide it, that we earn it, that it's completely on our own. Hey, way to go, us. Look how good I'm doing, what I did. Belly full. We think satisfaction and fulfillment and achievement comes from stuff, from material Security. If I just have more money in the bank, I'll feel secure. I'll have everything squared away. I won't have anything to worry about. We rely on stuff to sustain life, to be the source of our comfort and joy. God says that way is death. What happens when it's gone? <laughs> Guess who's never gone? God eternal. Jesus keeps the bread image going here. Not long after feeding the 5,000, belly's full, he tells people that they're only looking for him. They've gone and found him as he's come back across the lake. Um, He tells him, you're only looking for me because I put food in your bellies. And so he teaches this. He starts in John chapter 6, verse 48. Very short verse here. Not as short as Jesus wept, but not too far from it. He says, I am the bread of life. We've all heard that if we've been in church for a while. Why bread? Again, I think it's because bread is the most basic staple of physical life. But he says, I'm the bread of life. Jesus is the most basic staple of our spiritual lives. He is what we've got to feed on if we're going to have a full spiritual life. He is the true bread of life. He goes on, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, that should sound familiar now, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He's the fulfillment of everything that we read about in the Old Testament, even the bread stuff. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And that's where people started to say, huh? We got to do what if we're going to live forever? We've got to eat your flesh? Jesus was big on hyperbole. He was big on saying things in a way that you had to confront it and try to wrap your heart and your mind around it. This is one of those things. He is making a very important point, and so he doesn't want anyone to gloss over it, and you can't gloss over it when somebody says, hey, you got to eat my flesh. That will stop you in your tracks. The question we have to ask ourselves then is he's even comparing manna. He's saying, you know what, manna is still just bread. It's just obviously coming from God. Everything comes from God. I came from God, Jesus says, but I come to feed you in a wholly different way. Do you want to eat to not die? Or do you want to eat to live forever? Which sounds better? Uh, Do you want to eat to just prolong the inevitable one more day? Or do you want to eat to live forever? I know which one sounds better to me. You can eat all the physical bread that you want. You're still going to die just like the Israelites out in the desert. Jesus came not only to bring this better bread to the world, it turns out he is the better bread. He's not just the delivery man. He is the better bread. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's a really good question. When they begin to question that, 
when they begin grumbling about his claims. This guy's telling us we've got to eat his flesh. They begin grumbling about it. Jesus doesn't backpedal or soften his remarks. How did the modern church get so far away from his example? No, Jesus doubles down and ratchets it up. He ratchets up his remarks to drive home his point and make sure that no one can ignore it without confronting it. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, thanks for throwing that in there, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. That's how you grow a church. You talk like that. There were several accusations made against early Christians, those who followed the way. Um, they were actually called atheists, believe it or not, um, mostly because they didn't worship Caesar and they were supposed to be worshiping him, you godless pagans who don't worship Caesar. Um, the other, one of the other ones was they were accused of being cannibals because they talked like this. They talked about sharing the body and the blood of Christ when they would get together and have these meals. And so people heard this language and, and understandably were like, what is going on with these people? Well, I hate to tell you, but when people start asking that question, that's a really good opportunity to start telling them what's actually going on with you as a person. What Jesus is doing in your life, who he is, what he's done, salvation, forgiveness, all those things. And guess what? That's what we see in Acts when we get back into our Acts series. As all these people are seeing how these Christians are living, and they're starting to ask questions, and they're starting to share it. And the church grows. But eat his flesh, drink his blood. Back to differences between denominations as well. There's something called transubstantiation, which is the idea that is held in some, uh, some religions, some denominations, of the Lord's Supper actually becoming flesh and blood at the moment that it enters your mouth. Um, without going into a, a big, long exposition of that, the symbolism and the presence of Christ is deeply meaningful in the Lord's Supper without that. It's not necessary. The truth of what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about eat my flesh, drink my blood, is the true intimacy of taking on his sacrifice, his flesh, that sacrificial death, and believing in the power of his death, the blood, the wine, to forgive sins. He's saying, whoever, whoever believes that at the deepest, deepest core of who you are, whoever ingests that, brings that into themselves, makes it a part of them, feeds on that truth, feeds on me, whoever does that will find eternal life. And why not? Why, why shouldn't we expect this? We read in John, John starts his gospel off in a wholly different way than the other three. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Word. We've got to internalize Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Christians, they link breaking the bread 
breaking bread to the Lord's Supper, the true bread of life, God's word incarnate Jesus. God made flesh. God's word, the, the perfect representation of the character and person of God himself come as man, Jesus. Of course, of course, we have to make him a part of ourselves to find that eternal life that he provides. What satisfies your hunger? What do you truly feed on? What do you hunger for? Is it the world's bread? Is it satisfying each and every physical want or need that comes along? Because even we've seen just in these few short passages, the best that the world's bread can do is sustain life. There's nothing wrong with sustaining life. Life is good. It's worth sustaining. But even then, that bread, it comes from God, just like the manna did. The bread of life, though, that's truly satisfying. That is truly life-giving. Without Jesus, we walk in death. There's spiritual life when life is truly lived for him. So do you want to settle? Do you want to settle for a full belly? Or just for what the world offers as unfulfilling pleasures? But the bigger question is, do you want more? Do you want the bread of life? Food for eternal life. And guys, that starts now. This is not solely a future hope. Eternal life, everlasting life, starts the minute you give your life to Him, not at some point down the road. It starts as soon as we give our lives to Him. The truth of the matter is, God doesn't want you to settle for fleeting happiness or momentary pleasure that is honestly the best this world has to offer. God doesn't want any of us to settle for just getting by. No, Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's what Jesus came for. It starts now. It starts on this earth and it lasts for eternity in the presence of God. But it starts now. That's what God wants, abundant life here and now, lasting for an eternity. And I will take unshakable joy over temporary happiness any day. And it's yours in Jesus, the cornerstone. Why? Because when we have him, when we know who we are in him, when we live our lives for him, when we're wrapped up in him, we know that we're saved into eternal life in his presence. Nobody and nothing can take that away from us. That's reason for joy. We know that we are going to experience God's grace poured out on us for eternity. Amen, amen. I got that to look forward to forever. That's worth celebrating. You've got the assurance of that joy now, knowing nobody can touch me. Not even Satan. Satan can't pluck you out of God's hand. He can take you out of the game. That's a problem. But he doesn't have to, and you don't have to let him. You know that if you've repented of your sin and you believe on Jesus, that you can rest in that assurance. And there are so many things that we go through in life, so many struggles, so many heartaches, grief, loss of loved ones, so many things that we struggle through. But it's different when you're a Christian because you have that peace that comes from knowing where you stand with your God. Knowing that He is walking alongside you in whatever it is that you're going through. 
whatever point on the journey you're in, whatever little side trip on the itinerary you've fallen into, whatever it is, you know that he loves you and not because you just did something great. He loves you because he, that's who he is. He loves you. That's just God. Knowing that he looks after you, knowing also that he disciplines you, he disciplines you like a loving father would to grow you up, not because he's trying to harm you, but because he loves you. There's no need when you know that you belong to God. There's no need for anxiety. There's no need for depression. There's no need for worry. It comes, but it comes as we drift away from him. Not because of him. And for those of you that have gone through those things in your life already, and and that's probably everybody in here, you know that there is comfort in grief, knowing him. There is hope for your future, even in the midst of your struggles. God doesn't want you to settle for crumbs. He wants so much more for every person on this earth. He wants you to live life to the fullest, and that life is only found in Christ. The Bible tells us when you lose your life for his sake, that is when true life is found. Don't settle for crumbs. Don't settle for what the world can offer. It pales in comparison to what God offers. Jesus wants you to have the bread of life. He wants you to have all of him. He's offered it. He has put it on the table. Dinner is served. It is there. It is the best banquet you have ever been to in your life. And it is waiting for you to sit down and eat. But he leaves it in your hands. Yes, his Holy Spirit empowers it and enables it. Yes, his Heavenly Father provides for it and protects it. But he leaves it for each one of us to choose daily. What will you feed your life with? Choose the best. Choose to live on Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we come to you this morning with hunger. I pray that we come to you with a hunger that can only be satisfied with more of Jesus in our lives. And I pray that that hunger will never be satisfied on this side of the veil. Lord, help us to just seek more of him day by day. Help us to desire more of him in our lives. Help us to feed on your word as the life-sustaining force that it is, Lord, because it comes from you, because it is you. Lord, there are so many things vying for our attention. There are so many things in this world that want to be counterfeits, that want to take your place in our lives and in our hearts. Father, we ask for discernment. We ask for strength. We ask for biblical wisdom and knowledge to know what's what as we navigate the paths that you've laid before us. Lord, help us to pass the tests. Help us to overcome the temptations. Help us learn to live lives based on every word from the mouth of our God. Father, thank you for the way that you provide for us. Thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for the way that you discipline us. Thank you for the way that you walk with us and guide us. Thank you for your word showing us the way. Thank you for who you are. Father, we repent of our sins. We confess them before you this morning. If they're on our hearts this morning, I pray that we would raise them up to God. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
Father, help us to leave here in just a little while, having been fed by your word, having been re-energized, having been refreshed by your word, by being in the presence of the Holy Spirit, by feeding on Christ in a very real way. As we get ready to invite Harmony Ridge back up to sing a song for us, we're going to be entering into a time of invitation, a time of prayer. You can sit right where you are. You can pray to your God. He can hear you. But you're invited to come share your burdens up here at the steps. Share them with me. Lay them at the foot of the cross. God tells us in his word, he wants us to share those burdens with him because he loves us. And because he's capable of handling them. And if you've never given your life to Christ, if you realize this morning that you have been settling for crumbs, and you want the true bread of life, then come share that with me this morning as well. We will lift that up to God, and the angels will rejoice in heaven. Give your life to Christ, and you will begin life abundant. We're so blessed to be here this morning and to have a God like we have. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.